Hello and welcome to today's SEI web, webcast, Exploring an AI Engineering Body of Knowledge. My name is Shane McGraw, Outreach Team Lead here at the Software Engineering Institute, and I'd like to thank you for attending. We want to make today's webcast as interactive as possible, so we will address questions throughout today's talk. And you can type those questions into the YouTube chat area now, and we will get to as many as we can. Our featured speakers today are Carol Smith, Michael Matarock, and Carrie Gardner. Carol is a senior research scientist in the Human Machine Interaction Team here in our AI division. Michael is the program development lead within our AI division, and Carrie is a project lead also in our AI division. Now I'm going to turn it over to Michael Matarock. Michael, good afternoon, all yours. Hey, thank you, Shane. Uh, well, we're excited to, to speak with everyone today, uh, start to highlight an event that we're participating in next month. Uh, so Carrie, Carol, and myself will be at AI World Government, which will be taking place in Washington uh, the first week of October. So we're definitely excited to share some of our, our work that's going on across the division right now here at the Software Engineering Institute. Uh, and also gain some diverse perspective uh, across a number of panelists that we will be participating in that event. Uh, and so we, we plan to showcase our AI engineering body of knowledge concept that we're going to share with all of you today and talk a little bit about. Um, but before we get started, uh, just by way of introduction, uh, as, as Shane said, I'm Mike Matarock. I, I lead our uh, program development efforts here in the AI division. Uh, prior to arriving at the SCI earlier this year, my background focused on digital transformation, uh, autonomy, and some cybersecurity across the DoD in the federal space. Uh, so while grounded in systems engineering, much of my work focused on transitioning heritage systems to, to more dynamic capabilities for the warfighter uh, through the use of open architectures, uh, automation, uh, and evolving technologies like machine learning. Uh, and so here at the SEI, I'm excited to continue on a number of these areas, uh, specifically autonomy and, and helping the DoD to do great AI as, as well as it can be done. Um, Carol, did, did you want to share an introduction as we get started here? Thank you. Yes, I'm Carol Smith. Uh, I've been with the SEI for three years and prior to that worked um, with uh, AI systems and, and autonomous vehicles. I've uh, been doing that work since 2015 and before that, working across a lot of different industries, um, doing user experience and human-centered uh, design, human-computer interaction work uh, to make those systems more useful and usable for people. And uh, my work here is focused on human machine interaction um, and figuring out how do we make these systems uh, in a way that are uh, they're trustworthy for humans, that they are providing enough evidence for people to, to make good decisions. Uh, and uh, I look forward to, to sharing more. And uh, over to Carrie. Awesome. Thanks, Carol. So hello, everyone. My name is Carrie Gardner, and I have over five years of experience partnering with our federal government sponsors to spot and create innovative cybersecurity AI capabilities. And as a member of the technical staff, um, you may have known me from my time in our cybersecurity sister division, CERT, um, where I spent uh, almost five years uh, prototyping and optimizing insider risk management solutions. And one of the themes I kept repeatedly noticing uh, was some of these AI-enabled software technologies that insider threat programs would acquire um, to optimize insider risk management, weren't generating the value add that the program managers had envisioned. And my hypothesis then, and remains to be now, um, that there's not enough time and attention dedicated on thoughtfully designing how these systems are intended to be used in real world contexts, and what are the constraints and operating considerations. And so that was part of my transition story. I've been now in the AI division since February, and really excited to dig into these topics of AI engineering with Carol and Mike today. Um, and another quick plug for AI World Gov, um, I'm going to be a panelist on the Responsible AI as an Organizational Strategy panel. And I'm really excited to be sharing with that audience how organizations actually can find competitive advantage with being proactive versus reactive with Responsible AI. So with that, um, I think we want to perhaps preview um, our upcoming topics for today's conversation. Um, so what we'll be sharing with you all today, um, first, we'll be talking about identifying basic tenets for that AI engineering body of knowledge. 
We'll then transition into surfacing what novel AI engineering knowledge areas that we think are probably right and a good fit for building out that body of knowledge. And then we intend to close with thinking about how we can integrate both systems engineering, software engineering into building out this AI, AI engineering body of knowledge. So with that, um, Mike, perhaps I'll pass it to you. Um, so why do you think, you know, what's one of the motivators, if you will, for developing and formalizing AI engineering through this body of knowledge? Absolutely. I, I, thanks, Carrie. I, I think just to get us started as, as we start talking and, and really thinking about AI engineering versus just artificial intelligence in general, it, it's really tough right now, right, uh, to walk down the street and not hear AI, which has become such a buzzword. It, it's everywhere. It, it's permeated across industry, uh, across organizations, regardless of size uh, or maturity level. And so there, there are a lot of factors that we have causing this, this rush, if you will, to develop AI capabilities. Um, however, you know, at the SCI, we really take a, a bit of a different approach, right? We, we recognize that it is critical. Uh, a lot of the mission partners that we work with, we're talking about national security implications. So we wanna be very mindful of longer term considerations. And so in the wake of perceived short-term delivery, um, that may exist out there in terms of AI project development, we want to take more of a disciplined approach and really focus on AI engineering as opposed to just doing AI for the sake of AI. And so with that approach, um, you know, having more of a disciplined approach to proactively design AI systems uh, to function in, in really complex and ambiguous environments. Uh, many of our mission partners can't say for certain where a particular technology may be deployed. Uh, there are a lot of environmental variables that exist there, uh, as well as just different real-time mission scenario changes uh, that could also exist. And, and so really the aim is to equip practitioners uh, to develop systems across the enterprise to edge spectrum, uh, you know, really fully anticipate those requirements in a changing world in different environments, and, and then really doing that insurance assurance uh, that human needs are going to be translated into the ethical and trustworthy AI that we want to develop. Uh, and that really gets at, at a number of the areas that we focus on here as a team, uh, and that is helping to guide the research that, that we are uh, actively engaged in. And so I, I think in, in a lot of ways, the AI engineering body of knowledge concept uh, serves as, as kind of a, a Rosetta Stone, if you will. Uh, you know, it, it provides that common vernacular for diverse stakeholders to communicate with one another, um, with different members of their teams, uh, both within their organizations as well as outside their enterprise, uh, and helps us to establish common principles and practices uh, to be able to deliver reliable, responsible, uh, and effective solutions that we're able to have. Uh, and so I think this in turn really helps to, to deliver some of those leap ahead capabilities that federal leaders across the space are seeking um, in, in terms of that rush that, that I kind of alluded to for AI capabilities, but allows us to really take a step back and think about more of a, of a formalized approach where we can leverage some repeatability, uh, reusability and modularity in our design. Uh, as, as we continue on, I, I think that, that there are a number of different mission partners that we've interacted with that, that have showcased the need for this. Um, and the SDI AI division is really the place for, for something like this to be born. So we're excited to actively participate on this concept uh, and to be able to have uh, a deliverable offered. offered. Uh, I'll, yes. Oh, if I may actually step in, because you mentioned something about stakeholders and, you know, kind of elicit and curate a common knowledge base, a common language. And if I, I want to build on that point, if I may, um, because, you know, when I think about AI engineering and direct stakeholders that need to see some type of body of knowledge, you know, I think most people immediately think about the engineers. They think about the data scientists, the machine learning engineers, or system or um, data engineers as well. But I think that there's two or three other very key stakeholders that would benefit from this type of body of knowledge. And, you know, the, 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 the folks that I think come to mind for me are project product managers. I'm in project managers. So the folks that are actually supervising the construction of these AI engineering um, capabilities and systems and thinking about estimation and thinking about scheduling deliverables and scheduling workflows. It's also the project sponsor and thinking about, you know, who's actually going to be benefiting from this. 
And then of course it's the users, right? So who's actually interacting with that system? Um, so Carol or Mike, any responses to that and kind of thinking about, you know, who are those stakeholders for this AI engineering body of knowledge? Yeah, <clears throat> Timmy and I, I definitely agree with that list. Although I, the, the types of information they're gonna need um, are gonna vary um, quite a bit. So, so those developers need really detailed um, information about how to manage um, the data, how to um, manage model uh, maturity, and, and you know a variety of things around those technical aspects. Um, the project managers and acquisition people, and, and, and those types of individuals, are going to want to know how to you know what the system does, what it doesn't do, what what are the guardrails, um, what uh, types of uh, things they need to be concerned about. Um, whereas those end users, um, they need to have a high level understanding of the system, but they may not understand uh, or be able to explain what AI is, um, which may be okay, depending on the situation, uh, but they certainly need to understand that the system is working as intended or not, um, is uh, accessing information and data that it's familiar with or not, um, and, and those kinds of things. So um, the, the buy-in knowledge, I think, for them to be able to access it is really helpful for them to look up a term and, and understand what that is if they can. Um, whereas, um, yeah, I would I would say they are more um, they're less likely to use it on a regular basis, but still certainly access it. Whereas the other two groups, of course, um, need much more um, rigorous information about these systems and how they work, and, and you know that that understanding of them to approach them. I think that's a really good point because so often we we think of you know a body of knowledge or just even AI engineering and, and we have those developers, those engineers in mind. But you're right, Carrie. I, I think the intention here is AI engineering is a community effort, right? We have to make sure that folks across organizations are familiar enough. Uh, and I think back to kind of why the Software Engineering Institute was even born back in the 80s, right? With software, uh, as the name probably implies to most that aren't familiar with us, but uh, you know, we're really here to help those acquisition officers, um, program managers, COs across the DOD space um, to be able to, uh, you know, leverage and understand the technologies that we're working with. And I think just, just to cite one example on that front, we, we look at how paramount uh, data rights are in terms of software. And we saw, you know, for decades, the, the difficulty that the government has and still has to this day with being able to have availability of their own data. Uh, because of agreements that are entered into with different vendor communities um, and organizations like that. And so how can we make sure that we provide uh, information to those stakeholders so that way they have awareness uh, to be able to make the best decision possible for their particular system or their particular organization that they have? Yeah, and building on that briefly, um, the data piece is, is the one that, that is consistent throughout. Um, so the developers need to understand the data, the, the acquisition and, and project managers and, and all those people in, in the middle, so to speak, uh, need to have a firm understanding of that data and its provenance and, and you know, what it, what it is for and intended to do. And then the end users do too. So that's one of the ones where it really does um, cross um, every uh, type of um, individual who would interact in any way with that system needs to be um, aware of and familiar with that data. Yeah, I know we have some questions, but I do want to build on that just briefly as well. Um, that makes me think about, you know, the requirements engineering piece and, you know, requirements engineering, that's not a full concept of like all the inputs necessary to actually build and, you know, operate a successful AI, um, system. But there is this piece of understanding what's the governance of the data that's going into the model. What are the controls around that data? Um, and even thinking about um, the long-term life cycle of handling the sensitivity and then any type of governance structure that you have around the data and the model for that entire system. Um, I, I think there's been a number of projects I've worked on. I'm actually kind of thinking about one I'm, I'm working on today where you're trying to get access to a data set. And, you know, if it's, you know, whether it's not classified or controlled or some otherwise protected, you're, you do have to follow these procedures. And it takes time. And I think like just that expectation setting with those key project stakeholders up front really can illuminate and help, you know, alleviate potential hurdles as we start building and doing that construction work. Because just expectation setting of like this is going to take a couple of days to get access and go through that approvals chain is a necessary conversation to have. Absolutely. 
So Shane, so, we have some questions. We do have some questions. We're getting some lots of great questions in the chat. Uh, worldwide audience today, I've seen people from Argentina, uh, Alabama, Virginia, South Africa, uh, the UK. So we got a worldwide audience. So thanks for everyone's participation today. Uh, first question, um, how coordinated, this is a two-part question, how coordinated will this effort be with ongoing regulatory efforts and activities from other organizations, NIST AI, RMF, ISO, et cetera? And will this body of knowledge uh, address safety critical systems? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think I'll just, I'll kick us off and, and definitely want Carol and, and Carrie to add their thoughts as well. Um, but we, we definitely look at this as a collaborative effort uh, across the community. Uh, we want as much involvement as possible from industry, from government, from academia. Um, we want to collaborate on this initiative. And we also want to recognize that there are foundational tenets uh, that exist that we, that we can use in this AI engineering body of knowledge. I think of the software engineering body of knowledge, the systems engineering body of knowledge, both the SWE and CBOX. Uh, I think can really help inform uh, some of the principles and topics that we're talking about here, uh, as well as other efforts that are underway at NIST um, and IEEE with their guide on, on software engineering, starting to focus on uh, artificial intelligence. Um, I think of the MITRE's ATLAS framework as well as something that, that is, a, is a major player that we could look at and in, in incorporating into this body of knowledge. And of course, the ADEPT framework. Uh, that's out there when we particularly start to focus on human machine teaming uh, and the considerations that we have there around building trust and confidence. Yeah, I and then oh, I can jump in on the, the safety aspect. Um, the uh, you know, Certainly, depending on the situation, we wouldn't want to put a, uh, a very new and uh, unknown system in a critical situation necessarily, but as those as the systems develop, as we become more confident in their ability to be operational in those situations, we really do need to look at um, more formal hazards analysis type work that addresses uh, those high risk um, and safety concerns. So one of the projects I was recently doing was, was looking exactly at that, helping people developing AI systems to really take best practices from systems that were in, and frameworks and, and practices that were built for more stable systems and apply them to the dynamic um, AI systems and, and figuring out how to take, for example, failure modes and effects analysis, which is uh, you know a, a, a very solid system, but is not uh, applicable for an AI system and taking that information and figuring out how to apply it um, to these types of systems is, is some of the work that needs to be done as part of this AI by knowledge and, and also just to further uh, the practice of AI engineering. Yeah, and I'll build on from there. You know, I think, you know, if you think about the software engineering body of knowledge and the systems engineering body of knowledge, um, I take the position that the software engineering block is kind of an extension that's application specific for software systems. And likewise, you know, in personal opinion, I do think like the AI engineering block could be in a similar function where it's extending knowledge, both of software and systems to holistic AI capability and AI systems. And I, I think with that being said, I think that there's certain material specifically in the systems engineering block talking about system verification and validation that is highly relevant and needs to be built upon in this AI engineering body of knowledge. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about um, model and data testing. I'm thinking about once we're building, you know, whether it's a machine learning or an expert-based rule system model, that's going to be the, the brain, if you will, of your AI system. What types of testing needs to be done for like the unit level or component level testing before you start thinking about the integration? And then for the life cycle of these ML or rules-based models, what types of testing do we need to continuously do in order to pick up you know, differences with time, whether it's data drift, um, context drift, or any type of scalability issues where we need to make sure that that model still is meeting user expectations, still passes system verification and validation. So I kind of see the AI engineering block um, as building upon, yes, the existing knowledge areas that are present in systems and software, but then additionally adding um, AI specific things. And one other point, if I may, you know, thinking about um, critical systems, you know, immediately to me, like I jump to um, insider threat. And although that's not necessarily a safety issue, it, it's critical in the sense of 
real world impact, um, you know, where an insider threat analyst, one of the users of the AI enabled product, um, they could be making a call that could have life term impact upon someone's career and future. Um, and that's for really knowing the context, knowing how to use that tool, how to interpret the output from the AI is just so critical. And really looking forward to thinking through um, with this body of knowledge, how to you know build um, processes, how to build standards around explainability, audibility, and doing that intended use of the, the technology. Great. Just two quick other ones that we can work in this section. Um, is is there a link or something we can point attendees to for this body of knowledge? Does the SCI have something created now that we can link to or add to the chat? We, we do have a forthcoming landing page that's currently under development. So what we can do is, is follow up uh, with that link so that way everyone has it. Uh, it's currently under construction, but should be live later this week. Uh, uh, so we will, we will have that out there. Great. And Sushiro asks, who, who would be the point of contact at the SEI for interactions on the safety, critical, and hazard analysis aspects? Would that be you, Mike? Uh, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to be that point of contact uh, and, and definitely involve the team as, as, as appropriate on that, for sure. I, okay. I, so I, I, I lied. There's one, one more question, Mike, if we could work in this section, and I'll let you guys move on. Suzanne okay. asked, um, FMEA can be used for risk of data leakage and risk of unfolding ethical AI policies, couldn't it? Um, certainly. Yeah, yeah, it can be. Um, the, the problems are that those, um, so failure modes and effects analysis and, and similar um, sets of uh, practices were really created to be done once for a very um, stable system. So a system that was built and released into the environment, much like the CDs we used to get in the mail um, for software. Um, and these uh, systems with AI are not stable in any way. Um, so these systems, um, you know, adapt with or without new training data, um, with or without changing the model at all, the system can potentially change. And so we need to adapt those types of practices to deal with that more dynamic um, situation where we need to do more constant monitoring, um, more uh, you know, rigorous uh, training and testing and, and validation. All that, all that work um, is very different from what uh, those uh, other types of uh, systems were, were created to support. It, it's not that we want to throw it away. We want to build on it and add to it um, and make it make it work for these new systems. Absolutely. And, and I, I think on a couple of those, those uh, just testing uh, and starting to think about overall uh, how, how we approach, it might be a, a good time to just mention the, the three pillars that we've kind of looked towards to help guide us uh, across AI engineering. Um, you know, those three pillars, uh, and we'll dive into them, uh, but just as, as, as the punchline of them, you know, focusing on AI systems that are human centered, that are scalable, and that are robust and secure. Uh, and that's really one of the ways that we, we think about some of the considerations that were mentioned in the questions that we just had, uh, and just in how we want to approach this, this discipline in general. Uh, when, we, when we think about robust and secure AI, uh, there's an expectation that those systems will, will reliably operate at an understood level of performance, right? That expectation exists, even when there's a face of uncertainty, uh, danger, or, or adversarial threat. Uh, and one of the greatest challenges that we see uh, through a number of our, of our efforts and in, in collaborating with mission partners is the adoption of AI. Uh, in fact, that the confidence uh, of the systems will work as expected when they're deployed outside of a lab or, or another kind of controlled area. And so how do we start to look at building that confidence? These technologies are often tasked with really complex problems. Uh, and, and in many instances, there aren't any kind of perfect solutions. Uh, however, we wanna focus our goal from trying to master that perfect solution in a, in a single perfect outcome to really building confidence in AI throughout its life cycle, uh, like Carol had mentioned. Uh, so this, you know, this includes things like developing new tools and processes and practices uh, for testing, evaluation, um, verification, validation, uh, which is is really critical for building, deploying, and, and maintaining robust and secure AI systems. Carol, did, did you want to talk a little bit more about human-centered pillar? 
Yeah, certainly. Yeah, this is really to, to me the uh, the way that we build these systems has to be based on the, the humans who are going to be using the system. So making sure that we're designing them to work with and for people so that we understand the context of use and the complexities in that use. You've mentioned um, weather and, and other things. If we're building these systems in um, <clears throat> to me in a, an office setting, such as my lovely cubicle here by my office, um, that is okay, but it also has to be tested out in the environment. We have to take that system then out into the rain, out into the hot uh, desert sun, and, and make sure that the system is still behaving the way we expect it to. Um, that goes for um, you know systems that are doing um, uh, computer uh, vision, for example. <clears throat> if we test them and, and we have some use cases we can talk about, um, but if we if we train them on data that is not similar to what it will see in the environment, um, then the system will not perform as we expect it to. It will not be successful in the the way that we need it to be, um, and that um, is that bias that we that we add into a system just merely by selecting certain data sets. We're we're changing what the system can or cannot do based on those decisions. And those decisions uh, can mean that the system has a very limited context of use. Um, and then looking at uh, actually how the humans and the machines are going to team together. So how are they going to share information? How are they going to exchange information? Um, how do they know whose turn it is? Um, so uh, particularly with robotics and, and autonomy, again, that, that becomes much more important. Um, but even with a, a system that you're doing research with, um, you know, at your desk, you, you want to know what the system knows and you want to share what you've learned from a conversation in the hallway or, or wherever. And, and so being able to exchange the, that information is really important. And then finally engaging in, in the critical oversight to make sure that the system is behaving as intended, that it is giving not just um, accurate or um, uh, you know, confidence uh, metrics, but rather that the system really is providing content and context and uh, re recommendations, whatever the system is built to do that are um, helpful and um, they are relevant to the, the current situation. And that as the situational awareness changes, that system is either indicating it's no longer capable of performing or is uh, you know able to adapt to that situation. So thinking about all those um, aspects and how the human um, is understanding the system status and, and vice versa. Yeah. And then um, we want to look at uh, scalable. Gary, you want to talk about that? Yes. And I think your last point on adaptable systems lends itself very nicely to thinking about scalable systems as well. And so when we talk about scalable AI, we're talking about the ability of models, data, and infrastructure to operate dynamically and to be adaptive with varying mission needs. And typically that's in the form of different sizes of data or different sizes of input, different speed needs, whether it's training time in the battlefield or inference time where you have a production and you, you need to have uh, inference and those, those predictions done within milliseconds. And it's also context as you're shifting between um, doing computer vision in a desert scenario versus doing computer vision in a rainforest. So, Scalable AI really is reusable AI and it's production ready. And as an example, um, I think that was one that Carol is perhaps alluding to, was we're partnering with the DoD service branch to bring computer vision to the battlefield, but a, a very constrained DDL battlefield. So degraded, denied, intermittent, and, and low bandwidth in terms of it lacks internet, um, also very limited electricity needs or supply. Um, so we're doing uh, computer vision, op detection, computation on uh, a battery powered, um, constrained uh, device. And, and so that has really, you know, in some ways transformed how we even approach doing machine learning when we're, you know, really having constrained resources. And I think that, you know, that scenario is a very real one where, you know, we're able to demonstrate here's actually feasibly how we can architect this type of technology and provide real-time capability, real-time intelligence to the warfighter on the ground. Um, but we need to be able to think through trade-off analysis or think through how we're performing verification validation when we're operating in just a, a very different constrained um, situation and context. 
And so I think another way to also think about um, scalable AI is thinking about inference time and, and thinking about service level agreements. Um, so for instance, and in, there's situations where um, the models and the, the owners of those models, you know, do have arrangements with, with whatever dependency, whether that's a, a software solution that's expecting output or a user that's expecting output to have um, a particular inference done within milliseconds or within a particular time box. And these service level agreements allow you know, natural workflows for the relationship between the model and whatever third party dependent system. And you know, we need to be able to have um, engineering resources in place so we can think about the circumstances of transitioning um, a beta product or a beta prototype into that real world scenario that could be 10th of the size, you know, or a tenfold increase in the amount of data that's moving through that pipeline and being able to be consistently able to deliver inferences at the required speed. So, you know, just really thinking about, again, um, the need for these systems to be adaptable to those varying circumstances is a critical consider consideration for AI. One thing, if I may, so I, I do see that Peter Boatman um, had some questions about um, AI as like an academic, you know, CS in particular concept, and then thinking about bodies of knowledge, both, you know, academic bodies of knowledge as well as professional. I think that's a really good uh, distinction and, and thing to draw out. I'm going to share my take and, and um, Mike and Carol, I'm interested in yours. Um, you know, for us, you know, I think, you know, we're kind of championing AI engineering. So as an engineering discipline, as distinct from AI engineering as a science, which you know, our partners on campus at CMU are doing a great job taking leadership on. And I think with this body of knowledge, perhaps this is an opportunity to marry the science of academia and the, pra the practice of the AI engineering to provide the, the right instruction to really fit the conversation if you're, you're talking about the theoretical models, as well as if you're talking about constructing and building AI as a practice. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Carrie. I do think that it's a it's an important distinction to make, uh, and in many ways, um, you know, we 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 even even think about it internally uh, as as software. So so why not look at maybe updating the Swebok uh, to incorporate artificial intelligence? And and the way that we're approaching this is that distinction that exists of artificial intelligence engineering. So I think very much having having that kind of disciplined approach. Uh, thinking about um, you know software obviously uh, co coexists uh, is is a major enabler uh, for the systems that we're talking about using, um, but really thinking back to uh, and, and if you'll forgive me, I'll, I'll just do a sixty second American history lesson because I can never shake my my history undergrad. Um, but you know thinking thinking back to the time of building bridges, especially in Pittsburgh here, which is the city of four hundred and sixty some bridges. Um, you know, making that approach initially, uh, and, and, and not necessarily having standards, uh, and we saw fatalities that existed, right? Bridges falling down. There wasn't a cohesive, uh, discipline. And, and af after that, as a society, we recognized the importance of establishing a civil engineering discipline. And in a lot of ways, those, the same kind of tenants really resonate with what we're talking about in AI engineering. How do we make sure that we are building solutions? Uh, that are scalable, that are robust and secure, that are human-centered, um, that are able to be sustained. Uh, I think that's another big piece as well through the life cycle, right? We, we have to make sure that we're cognizant of developing feasible solutions, um, not necessarily just ivory tower uh, thoughts that are great exercises, but actually things that can be deployed in the field and, and leveraged by the warfighter, uh, leveraged in industry uh, and beyond. And so I, I do think that it's an important distinction to make because there are a lot of lessons that we can pull in from systems engineering and software engineering, um, but really AI engineering standing as its own discipline, uh, separate from more the computer science domain of just AI, uh, as well as software engineering. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add to that, although I will say that many of the um, frameworks and uh, practices for uh, software engineering, uh, unfortunately, leave out the human. Um, and that's the biggest change, I would say, with, with AI engineering due to the um, unfortunate uh, outcomes that people have seen with systems that they've tried to build with uh, data that 
uh, was not thoroughly understood, the, the bias in that data creating uh, really unhelpful situations in that they were, uh, the AI system found patterns in the data and then propagated that across the entire uh, system um, when it was the wrong pattern to uh, to find. And, and those kinds of uh, missteps that uh, have occurred in um, AI systems uh, are, I hope, helping to change that perspective and to make sure that human-centered uh, work is a huge part of uh, the effort from the very beginning, and that it's not um, an afterthought or um, a uh, something you fix later, um, but rather from the very beginning, understanding the context and the need and making sure that the data is the right data for that need, and then making sure that the system is designed in such a way that it will be successful um, and able to be monitored and, and maintained in the way it needs to be. So um, it is very much building on those previous ones and improving in a variety of ways that the AI really forces us to do. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with all that. And I think one more thing that um, Mike, you actually was making you're making me think about um, drawing that analogy to construction, drawing that analogy to like you know physical infrastructure, is you know our digital infrastructure society now is just so heavily dependent, right, on software. Yeah. Uh, on AI to optimize things like electricity supply. And it's really incredible to think about, um, you know, how quickly the, the change has been made, um, you know, from the traditional rules-based system to now, you know, it's being optimized in some instances by ML-based empirical model. And, and so I think that also goes to your point about how, you know, we do need to be thinking about this as an engineering field where we have real-world systems that are out there that do need to be tested where there's, you know, not just like a mathematical model in some cases, but you, know, you just need to have it tested in the production environment and thinking about what are the constraints and benchmarks perhaps um, that, you know, you could expect from these like technologies and the building blocks even of like the, the pre-trained models that might be used as input to building that larger system. Mm -hmm. So with that, do we want to segue to um, surfacing some novel AI knowledge areas? And uh, before we do that, and you know, Carol, I'll probably pass it to you first. Um, for the audience, you know, please, I'm really interested in hearing um, what are some novel knowledge areas that you know you think would be really useful for this AI engineering body of knowledge that we're talking about. Um, so please feel free to drop those in the chat, and Shane will um, kindly give us those questions and comments. Uh, maybe, Carol, you want to open us up um, with talking more about um, the novel area of human machine teaming and trust and responsible AI? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so these are um, terms that I think people are hearing more and more, the, the idea of human machine teaming or human in the loop. Um, how uh, you know humans really need to uh, partner in with these systems in ways that we haven't previously. With with our regular computers, we put some information on the screen and we might push a button and, and have it go somewhere or do something. But the system itself is not um, responding um, in ways that AI systems can. And and so as AI is, is more and more integrated into our systems, we need to figure out better ways of. Um, having people and, and machines really work together versus the machine uh, just being a tool. It becomes more of a partner, still just a computer, but but more of a partner with us, which is really exciting because it, it extends um, our ability to uh, do work more quickly, we hope, uh, maybe uh, you know do that work um, in more detailed ways and more accurately, et cetera. Um, and then another aspect of this is, of course, the responsible AI work. So really thinking about the systems that we're building and how we can maintain responsibility for them, keeping humans um, in charge of the systems, making sure that humans can turn them off, uh, can uh, you know really not um, feel that the system is, is working against them, but rather the system is really um, a system that they um, understand that they are willing to be responsible for. Um, and that the system is reflecting the uh, the values of the work. So for the Department of Defense, there are the um, five um, aspects of uh, responsible AI or, or the AI um, ethics principles that were released two years ago. And you know, building on that is is really an important aspect of that work, making sure that people understand um, what the responsibilities are for building these systems and how to implement 
um, the, that guidance. Uh, the Defense Innovation Unit uh, worked with us a few years ago, well, a year ago, um, developing the Responsible AI Guidelines, and that's one uh, set, and there are more, um, more and more pieces of uh, support being offered to people to help them to implement Responsible AI, and of course that will be part of the, uh, the AI engineering uh, by knowledge as well. And then finally, thinking about trust. Trust is a really loaded word, and, and often people talk about, you know, we have to you know, build these systems that people can trust, but we want to make sure that we do that in a responsible way itself. It's not that we would want systems that people trust 100% of the time, much like our colleagues, we want to make sure that we understand their capabilities, their limitations, their availability, um, and is, is the system able to perform right now the way I need it to or not? Um, and if not, okay, what else can I do? Um, and so really having a level of calibrated trust based on the information that's available, based on the, um, the evidence that the system is providing, as well as uh, thinking about what is the, um, the level of evidence that is required, what, what kind of information is gonna be needed to have a justified uh, level of competence in the system. So there are a lot of different areas to, to look at with, with these topics and really thinking again about the people who are gonna use it and what um, we, where we know they are right now and where we uh, you know, want them to be successful and, and how these systems can enable them. We really need to think about how uh, humans are gonna actually work with the, with the machines. And then uh, do we want, do we have a question, Shane, or should we keep going? So we've got lots of questions. Do you guys want to pause to catch a little bit from the backlog? And then maybe you can, we'll look at what other novel things came in the chat. But we had a question earlier from Terge asking, seems like hybrid intelligence is the way to go given the risk with complete automation via AI. How can we make AI and humans work together efficiently? Yeah, and that's exactly what we're what I was talking about exactly. Figuring that out is not easy. Humans are complex, as we know, much more in some ways than, than even an AI system. And so figuring out what is going to be successful in a given situation is, is really important. Um, understanding the context, the people, um, and, and how that system is going to fit into the existing situation and, and how it will be used. Um, there, there are no easy answers there. It's really um, dependent on the situation and the system itself um how how to uh to answer that question okay next we have if possible can you indicate if you envision the ai body of knowledge to address performance assurance and development development assurance and appropriate mitigations for safety critical I, I, i'll jump in with that piece and, and that that starts to begin our conversation i think around metrics development right um, this is a, a timely topic of just how do we start thinking about effectiveness? Uh, how do we also focus on accuracy uh, as well? And what are those considerations that we use to ensure that an anticipated solution is well aligned to the objective that it was set out to be developed for? Uh, I think that that is a topic that, that will be front and center in our early exploration that we have through this forum. Uh, you know, again, we want to have a lot of participation from across the community, across industry, government, academia, uh, and we welcome those ideas. Uh, it's definitely something that we want to look at addressing within this body of knowledge uh, when we start to think about things like model resiliency and risk, right? That That's another, I think, novel area that we have within AI that, um, you know, poses some potential challenge um, and, and something that we want to develop to be able to have guiding, um, you know, key performance indicators, if you will of how successful an effort is, uh, in addition to looking at things like return on investment and so forth. Uh, I know we had a question from Henry asking about, uh, we have some openings for embedded engineers, but I believe that was within our software solutions division. Uh, I know our divisions work very closely, so I don't believe those jobs are tied to the AI division, but maybe quickly plug in, what jobs are available within the AI division? Are, are you guys currently hiring, Mike? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. We're, we're always looking for great AI talent, uh, and, and we're excited about some of the roles that we have right now. You know, we continue Carol's team that she's a part of, she has a really effective group on user interface and user experience. Um, so we always need, need support there as we continue to, to look building that team. Um, you know, we, we look for, for folks that maybe not, not necessarily have a, uh, a, a standard formal background in artificial intelligence, but I think of some of our, some of our leadership, you know, having really strong backgrounds in statistics and physics um, and being able to leverage those fields 
uh, into new opportunities that we have. So I would say if anyone is interested in you know joining the AI division here at the Software Engineering Institute, we'd love to talk to you. Um, we do have a, a number of, of positions available currently on our website that you can access uh, through CMU Careers. Uh, and if there is something there uh, that, that you're interested in, uh, definitely apply. If there's, there's not something there and, and you are really eager to work with us, you know, I would say don't be afraid to, to drop an email to, to info at sei.cmu.edu um, because we're happy to talk to you uh, and there could be a position coming available in the future that aligns great with your skill sets. And if I may add on just one point there, Mike. Um, so embedded engineering, that does make me think about the advanced computing lab. And I know I've been looking for some talent um, in that hardware space and thinking about what's next gen in terms of hardware software for ML and AI. So that's also something to be aware of, Henry, um, when you're looking at um, career opportunities with the SCI. I do think we have some information about the work that's being done in that advanced computing lab that might be a good fit for you. Great. If we get two more in this section, I think we'll be caught up and we can turn it back to you guys for, for some, some wrap up. Uh, but Chuck asks, how can AI assist humanity in effectively and efficiently achieving the UN 17 sustainable development goals by the year 2030 to prevent things now threatening human freedom and security? Any comments there? Yeah, so it, 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 there are a variety of ways, um, but it will not solve all of humanity's uh, problems. Unfortunately, it's, the AI are still just computers. So uh, tactically, uh, you know, there are certainly, um, we're seeing much better weather um, forecasting now, much more accurate still, you know, sometimes we're not sure why why things happen, but um, but things like that are are becoming much more helpful. A lot is being done in farming um, to uh, to support more uh, drought tolerant farming techniques and uh, and to help people to uh, to do better farming. Um, certainly, uh, here in Pittsburgh, there is a greenhouse that uh, that is run on uh, autonomous systems and AI and uh, make salads um, in, in you know purely greenhouse machine driven. Um, so there are pieces of that work um, that are um, being done to uh, to support those goals. But um, you know, much like um, you know, hunger and things like that, a lot of these are people problems. These are social problems that we have to make tough decisions about. The AI systems are not going to be able to fix them. Um, they can help us in our pursuit of various solutions, but they are not. Um, they're not capable of solving our problems. We have to solve them ourselves. But back to earlier comments, though, I think that is an opportunity thinking about AI as that hybrid intelligence, that decision support tool. So maybe there's an opportunity here and we're thinking about these grand um, you know, humanitarian challenges um, for the AI to come in, working with the human experts and kind of like driving towards optimizing the solution, optimizing some output or calculation to drive down hunger, to drive down or to optimize perhaps even electricity consumption. Exactly. And one quick example, perhaps, is thinking about humanitarian assistance in the XV2 project, um, where, you know, I think, you, you know, that was it like 2018 or something that originated um, as like a, a challenge for ML to go in and, you know, help identify the image buildings. And, and now um, I understand that there's that, that technology has been reused in even, you know, situations like Ukraine. And so that's a great example of you know how we can help out um, you know humanitarian situations with advanced technology like AI. Definitely. Absolutely. All right, last one. Then I'll turn it back to to, to you, Mike, for you guys can start maybe uh, closing thoughts. But uh, Pat, who asked a question, I I think Carol, you might already touch on this, but I'll I'll ask it. Would you please comment on the bias in the AI algorithm development and its impact on the validity validity, the impact on people? the impact on so many other things. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So um, data is uh, made by humans. So it's it's always going to be biased um, because we are collecting and creating and curating that data for a reason. Um, it, it may be a very obvious and uh, important reason. There, there, there's, you know, there's a, a purpose behind that. Um, and it may be something that we're not aware of. There may be some unknown bias in the data that we're not aware of. And so we need to really understand the data that we're using to build these systems and what bias is in the data and not look at trying to remove the, the bias because we really can't. There, there's going to be some reason why that data is being used. We, we need to solve some problem, which 
is in itself a, a bias as well. Um, and then matching that data um, with uh, models that are appropriate and that do not um, make a existing negative bias um, overly um, important in the system. So really understanding how the data and the model are working together and what uh, meaning is being created or recommendations or whatever it is, and then tracking to make sure that any bias that we know of in the system is not creating a problem and bias that we may not be aware of is identified um, as quickly as possible and then that is addressed. And in some cases, um, we've seen um, that, that there are systems that simply cannot be uh, made because the data is so um, problematic. So there were a number of attempts to make, for example, mortgage um, systems that were reducing uh, racism um, in mortgage lending um, in the U.S. Unfortunately, because the data showed bias against uh, Black and Latino borrowers, when using that data to create a new system, it instead of trying to make it more fair, it actually continued to propagate that problem across all borrowers. And so instead of potentially working with someone who was racist themselves and one individual not getting a good loan, gain a higher interest rate. Now the system gave anyone who it thought was Black or Latino a higher interest rate. So it was um, taking racism and systematically applying it across the entire um, group of humans. So um, we just have to be very cognizant of the history um, because data shows history and the bias in that history and make sure that we understand what is in that data and how it might be misapplied um, or misused or, or become uh, really harmful to humans. I, I think also to Carol's point, it also brings up something we talked about a little bit earlier in, in the segment as far as having diverse representation of users, right? Yes. I think with artificial intelligence permeating so many different aspects of daily operations, um, you know, uh, take an HR example, right? We, we saw not so long ago a large organization that ran into trouble with bias in, in its hiring uh, algorithm and its applicant tracking system. Uh, and so HR, uh, that's an area that definitely has to become smarter with the, the proliferation of human resource information systems uh, and using AI in those kinds of decisions of, of ATS and, and which resumes to review and making sure that there aren't, um, you know, intentional biases there uh, that are preventing uh, a variety of candidate populations from being seen. Yeah. So yeah. I, yeah. I was just going to add the not only the the thinking about the end users, but but also the people making the system being uh, diverse. So so by having a diverse group of developers, a group the diverse group of people who have different degrees, different backgrounds, educationally, et cetera, um, you're going to be able to think about these problems in different ways than you would if everyone had gone to the same program or had the same background or was of the same race, et cetera. So so that kind of diversity as well. Yeah. So I think we're caught up now with the questions, Mike, so you guys can move into your uh, final thoughts. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Shane. And uh, definitely appreciate the the attendee participation. Uh, so I think those are some great questions that, that hit at what we're trying to achieve here in developing an AI engineering body of knowledge. Um, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to being at the AI World Government event here uh, in the next couple of weeks down in Washington, as I know my colleagues, Carol and Carrie are. Um, so I'll, I'll be chairing the scaling and operationalizing AI uh, segment. Uh, so looking forward to talking about this concept in more detail there, uh, as well as hearing some additional perspective on, on how we want to approach AI going forward across the federal space. Um, and, and there are a lot of implications there, not just for our focus uh, on national security here as the SEI, but really across government uh, and across industry uh, for a lot of the applications that, that we have. Uh, so I definitely would, would like to highlight um, if you're going to be at the event, uh, whether virtually uh, or in person, um, you know, please reach out. We're happy to connect. Um, definitely keep an eye on, on the uh, upcoming landing page that we'll have. We'll make sure that that link shared if you want to get involved. Um, I would say we're, we're really, I, I just want to emphasize, we're really seeking participation uh, in the AI Engineering Body of Knowledge Forum. So a lot of the points that Carrie made and that Carol made uh, and that I talked about, we want to continue that discussion. Uh, we want to expand upon these areas. We, we welcome dissent too. Um, you know, we, we, that's only going to make a stronger artifact, a stronger product uh, that's able to be adopted across a number of different organizations that we want to serve. 
so really just want to emphasize that point and welcome um, Carol and Carrie. Uh, what, what about closing thoughts that, that you may have? Yeah, sure. I, I will be uh, also at, at AI World Government, really looking to see everybody there. I'm going to be talking about implementing responsible human-centered AI, so really diving a bit more into some of those concepts I was talking about today. Um, and, uh, you know, again, we are looking for people who, you know, who are interested in this work. Um, and uh, if you don't really feel like you have a good uh, basis of knowledge, there's some great programs online even um, that you can get into if you want to learn more about these topics. And we encourage people to learn more and to um, as Mike mentioned, you know, really, you know, poke, poke at these questions, ask, ask difficult questions, challenge people, challenge the people you're working with, um, you know, make sure that those systems are being built in ways that are responsible and that you are going to be uh, proud to, uh, to say that you were part of. Absolutely. And, you know, um, so I guess share my closing thoughts here. Um, I'm excited to be at AI WorldGov certainly in the next couple of weeks. And like I mentioned at the top, I'll be a, a panelist on AI, like you doing um, AI responsibly as an organizational strategy to really lean into some of the competitive advantages organizations can find from, from doing that. Um, one thing I've been thinking, you know, throughout our conversations today, uh, which is, you know, we are a great voice and, you know, building this AI engineering momentum and, you know, thinking about this AI engineering body of knowledge. But you know, we're also looking to share the podium, and there's a lot of excellent thought leaders out in this space. Um, and we're looking to build relationships uh, with those thought leaders, as well as you know others, you know, in the conversation to really carry forward, um, you know, building out the body of knowledge. So, looking forward to establishing, you know, and thinking about NIST and some other great agencies and how we can, you know, curate the types of knowledge areas and content. And two, if I may highlight, I, I think that it stood out to me recently, um, Sam Charrington, he's an AI expert and he's a convener and has a, a weekly podcast that has been just excellent material. So if you guys aren't aware of him just yet, I would put that down as something to think about. And then another one is a CMU faculty member, Christian Kastner, and he's actually writing a, a textbook on production ready ML. And so that's just another example of folks, you know, contributing, you know, work and you know engineering practices and sharing those with the community and how we all can come together and building out um, this forthcoming engineering body of knowledge. Excellent. I, I, I do think that both you and Carol hit on really important points. I, I find, and as I'm sure you do with a lot of our mission partners and, and other folks uh, across industry, there's just sometimes a real intimidation of hearing AI or you know AI engineering even. And I, I, I'm a movie guy, so I, I try to share this. You know, I, I don't want anyone to have that intimidation to prevent them from reaching out to different sources, uh, like Carrie mentioned and, and that Carol mentioned as well, uh, to really understand more and to get engaged. Uh, back to the movie reference piece, you know, I, I like to think of, of what we're doing here, uh, not like Terminator. That's not what we're doing. Uh, we're, we're definitely more of the Tony Starks with Iron Man uh, and embracing that human machine teaming. Um, you know, I think like like Carol said, AI is is very much computer dependent, and we have to to recognize that. Um, and and I, I I just think about you know having the human in the loop, uh, making sure that we're a part of that decision making is critical. And it's not necessarily a replacement piece that we're looking at, but rather rather how can we use that wild and crazy suit to do some really incredible things. Uh, and to the earlier point on uh, UN objectives, how can we make sure that we're doing good with that as well uh, and making sure that, that those intended solutions uh, are operating ethically uh, for what we do. So I, I think that that wraps up our webcast for today. Uh, I just, just want to thank everyone again for attending and participating with us. Um, you know, please continue to stay engaged. We look forward to future ones and future discussions. Uh, just talking about the AI engineering body of knowledge. Uh, and also, uh, uh, please, I uh, just want to welcome participation from you if you want to get involved and be part of the AI engineering body of knowledge forum, uh, or feel free to connect with us if there's some interesting research that you want to collaborate on as well. Shane, I'll, I'll pass it over to you to close us out. Yeah, Michael, Carrie, Carol, great discussion today. We really appreciate you guys sharing your expertise. Uh, leading this discussion. We had a lot of great activity in the chat today, um, some things that we can follow up on. I know some people were looking for some links that were mentioned during the talk, so we'll be sure to send those out uh, to attendees as well. We do definitely want to thank everyone for spending some time with us today and attending. 
Uh, as we mentioned during the event, the SCI is a strategic research partner for this year's 2022 AI World Government. The show takes place October 6th and 7th. And this two-day forum educates federal agency leaders on proven strategies and tactics to deploy AI and cognitive technologies. For more information, see AIWorldGov.com. Upon exiting today, if you'd like the information that we talked about today, please be sure to hit that like button and share the archive if you found value. Also, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the SEI seal in the lower right corner of the video window. Lastly, join us for our next live stream, which will be October 4th, and our topic will be using open source to shrink the cyber workforce gap. Registration information will be on our website, is on our website now, and will be emailed out as well. Any questions from today's event, please send to info at sei.cmu.edu. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.